who knows where the babies come from? So my name is Hendrik Jan Gieving. I'm designer at Next Nature Network. And do we have a visual? Yes. Um, and I'm going to update your vision on nature and technology, and maybe also where, how we are going to reproduce in the future. So, but let's zoom out first a little bit. Let's look at what our next nature actually is about. Let's look at our planet that we inhabit. If we take an astronaut perspective here, um, what do we see? We see this blue marble floating around, um, but there's all these kind of glowing dots on it. It's, uh, it's, it seems like the planet is on fire. Is it? Or is it spring and is it blossoming? Let's zoom in. What can we discover here? We see differences between the blue states and the red states. We see upcoming economies in India. We see Europe, like a Christmas tree with a very bright star in the east. We see some places in the planet where it's not so much is happening, Greenland. The Amazon rainforest is larger than you might think, but we also can read natural structures from space. We see the Sahara de Desert and rivers, such as the River Nile. And of course, that river is not so bright because of the river itself, but of all the cultural activities around the river. We see the upcoming of huge metropolises, such as Beijing and Shanghai and Tokyo and also different political systems and economical decision-making, such in North and South Korea. And where are we? We find ourselves in one of the most densely populated areas in the world. We are here in the Triangle, Amsterdam, Brussels, Cologne, one of the most brightest places on our planet. And if we zoom out even more, not only distance, but also in time, we see this lump of rock, that's our planet, five billion years ago. It was just this bare like, rock with a solid or with a uh, fluid core. And it took three billion years before the biosphere started to emerge. Uh, the biosphere with the oceans and the forests. And it took another billion years before the humans arrived. And humans with their ingenuity created this whole sphere of technology on that biosphere. And it's an important notice that all these spheres impact each other. The biosphere impacted the geosphere, but of course the technosphere heavily impacts the biosphere. We only have to open the newspapers to see what that means. Climate change, uh, pollution, the human footprint is everywhere. So what do we see when we land on Earth and we look around? Some simple questions we can ask ourselves. For instance, do we still have natural experiences, or has nature turned into some kind of cultural activity, something we do for leisure in the weekends? The, the cultural or the natural environment that we have evolved from as species has been largely replaced by a world of technology, and this technology becomes so intricate and interwoven and complex that we start to relate to it as a nature of its own. So it might be that we need to update our image of nature. Rest assured, this is a Photoshop, it's not real. It's made by an artist. But I think it speaks some kind of truth. Uh, evolution goes on. We are not the end point of evolution. It's a continuous process. And humans will be catalysts of evolution. Nature becomes culture. Culture becomes nature. And the born and the made are fusing. Now let me go into that a little bit more. So the, for the past 2,000 years, we've worked with this bipolar opposites, the born and the made, the, uh, nature, technology. But this, does this still work? Uh, when we start printing organs, growing meat in the laboratory, um, technology becomes more and more autonomous, uh, does this help us? So we would like to introduce another axis, an axis of control. And what do we find when we start filling in this? On the lower left corner, we see things that are grown, you could say, born, but they're also somewhat controlled. I like to take a bonsai tree. It's, a, yeah, it's nature, but without humans, it wouldn't, take, wouldn't have its shape as it is. 
or an example more closer to home, the banana you buy in the supermarket. A banana that grows in the wild is green, has a very thick skin, uh, it's very difficult to peel, it has seeds, it's not really edible. This banana is hyper nature. It's designed for us to consume. It's a consumer product. It also cannot reproduce itself. It needs humans as kind of external sex organs to, uh, to reproduce. And of course, there's still uh, a lot of old nature. Uh, uh, viruses, the weather, volcanic eruptions, uh, solar flares in the universe. The thing is that if we have to if we want to look for this untouched, pristine nature, we have to go either to the bottom of the ocean or to the outskirts of the universe. Everything in between has more or less been touched by humans already. Now, this is an easy category. Uh, products that roll out of the factory, like your smartphone, your clothes, uh, cars, uh, human-made, also more or less controlled. Now, I think the most interesting things happens in this top right corner, where we find things that are man-made, yet they start to escape our sphere of influence. So we're not only talking about the car, but we're also talking about traffic jams and highways. We're not talking about a single computer, but networks of computers, such as the internet, but also computer viruses, uh, the, the more the dark side. And what about the financial system? It's man-made, created by humans, but as we've seen in 2008, when these algorithms behind the financial system go a bit weird, we run the risk of system collapse. So we're creating some kind of yeah, new sphere here that's, yeah, that starts to behave more and more autonomously. And when we talk about nature, yeah, for the past 2,000 years, we have always talked about the left side of this diagram, yeah, everything that's born. But maybe in some future, we will start seeing nature in a different way more like everything that's beyond our control. And we see the emerging of a new type of nature, nature caused by people, and we call it next nature. And in this vision, technology becomes our next nature. And this technology, or this next nature, is as beautiful, but also as wild and unpredictable or even dangerous as the old nature. Now I want to zoom in a little bit on one specific aspect of this next nature. And I want to zoom in on how we come into this world. A while ago, I came across this article on the website of The Guardian, and it spoke about artificial wombs, and it struck me in a really weird way. It's like, whoa, this is a very disruptive concept, but what is it actually? So I started doing some research, and it turned out that the process of ectogenesis, because that's what we're talking about, it means birth outside an organism's body. That process was already envisioned almost 100 years ago. Conceptually, um, yeah, and also uh, the first uh, attempt to patent an artificial womb had been done already in the 50s, 1955 to be exactly. So we're looking at a, yeah, a baby fetus in some kind of plumbing system. It doesn't look really nice to me. It looks a bit... Yeah, uncanny and, uh, and weird. But yeah, people have thought uh, about this. So technically, what are we talking about? We're talking about a container, uh, a tank that contains amniotic fluid and a fetus that yeah, floats in that. On one hand, nutrition and oxygen has to go in. On the other side, uh, waste material has to go out. Plus, we need some kind of interface to control all that. Well, this is like a very conceptual blueprint. But what does it actually mean? Because it's such a radical idea. One way to look at it is to look at it from a perspective of uh, reproductive technologies that already exist, such as contraceptives. Uh, they already in the 20th century um, disconnected sex from uh, reproduction. But these technologies, they have the potential to disconnect the body from reproduction. So on one hand, it's a continuation and an alignment of what's already there. On the other hand, it seems to be such a more radical idea and it's an idea that we really have to kind of let sink in before we even can decide whether we want that or not. Because, of course, we run into a minefield. It opens so many questions about 
bonding between mother and child, instrumentalization of the body, but also questions around equality. What if men could be pregnant or same-sex couples could have babies or other people that normally can't have babies can have babies now? In the 70s, there was one, was one particular person who had very strong vision on this. Shulamit Firestone, very radical feminist, she wrote a book, Dialectic of Sex, where she basically argued that in her vision, pregnancy was something, an inborn inequality between men and women. And she argued that we should do every means uh, necessary to, kind of, to get rid of that. Very radical vision. Not many people have argued, uh, have taken that stance. And it seems very difficult for us to kind of even go there, even start to think there, because we, we have all these images. Huh? We have, we're stuck with images from science fiction novels, Brave New World, movies like The Matrix, but also practices of eugenics, uh, making better people through uh, human enhancement in the Second World War. So where to even begin? Well, I'm a designer, so I look at images. Um, and I look at how people yeah, give meaning uh, to this. So humans have always told uh, stories through images, also about uh, fertility. And for centuries already, there has been this fantasy of creating life outside the human body, here in a, some kind of flask. Um, the process of having babies and pregnancy and birth is already very much technologized. We have baby incubators, we control our your hormonal cycles, uh, the first uh, test tube baby was born out of IVF 40 years ago. Uh, birth is no longer gendered. We've seen the first transgender pregnancies and deliveries. It seems that birth or having babies becomes more of a choice than a gift, as we saw it in the past. Now, what's the future here? Some people say, well, yeah, in the future we'll all have sex with robots. I'm not sure if that's really a scenario. But to say something meaningful about this, I think it's more interesting to look at what's actually, actually happening. So a year ago, the following movie aired on YouTube and it went viral in a week. I'm gonna show you a little clip. So what we're looking at here is a lamp that floats in yeah, a bag filled with fluid connected to all kind of tubes and basically it looks like a prototype of an artificial womb. All the people I talk to, they have very strong responses to this video. Usually 50% of them is go like, oh, this makes me really uh, uncanny, I find it very nasty to look at. The other half is like, wow, it's actually very beautiful. I can see the process of life coming into being, it's all transparent, and it, yeah, it offers me completely new trans uh, yeah, vision on uh, or a new perspective on life. But the scientists who actually do this, if you ask them, uh, yeah, will, will this ever be available for humans, they take a huge step back. They're like, no, 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 no. This is just research. No, we're just doing, we're testing out, we're, we're learning here. But of course, when you put such a movie on the internet, the gene is out of the bottle, and this image will always st stick with us. So I think it's not, it's a bit of a false sense of neutrality. Uh, and when this, uh, yeah, when this is visible, some people will want this. So I'm convinced that at some point, some person is going to develop this. But then how? So the question that lies before us is, how are we going to make babies in the future? How will our reproductive futures look like? How do we want them to look like? We kind of know what's possible, but what's preferable and who decides that? It's a very complicated question. But also, what is the cultural perspective here? So I would like to introduce you to Reprodutopia, a new project of the Next Nature Network, the world's first gender-neutral pregnancy clinic, where we present cultural visions by artists and designers on this issue, such as uh, male pregnancy by Nana McLean, uh, this IKEA style, Artificial Boom by Billy Reault, uh, Designer Babies by Aggie Haynes, or this movie by Ai Hasegawa. She saw herself uh, confronted with issues around having babies, and she made the decision, what if I would not put another human on Earth, but 
use my reproductive abilities to put an endangered species, to help endangered species reproduce, such as dolphins. Now, of course, this is an artist's vision. It's, it's not meant to become a reality. It's meant as a mirror to kind of make us think. I'm not sure if this will ever become a reality, but I think it's safe to say that the families of the future might look very different and might look much more colorful than the nuclear families that most of us has been raised into. Now, we as humans, we have co-evolved with our technology. And to a certain extent, technology also needs us to survive, to reproduce. But we seem to arrive at a point that we start to technologize our own reproductive uh, abilities. So how to proceed? And one thing that we can do, and maybe should do, is look at nature. What's happening in nature? What can we learn from the birds and the bees? Will we carry our babies, maybe not inside our bodies, but close to our bodies, like kangaroos? Will we, just like the birds, start making some kind of human version of the egg, the human egg? Or will we become uh, like seahorses, some indigenous, sexless species that we just harvest cells from our skin, turn them into sperm and eggs? That's already possible, scientists are working on that. So is that the future for us? Will it remain science fiction? I don't know, open question. I think one thing is very important, that we make sure that this becomes not just kind of another toy for the ultra-rich, the Kim Kardashians of this world. That it becomes, if, if we proceed this way, that it becomes inclusive and that we're all involved in the discussion around this. Do we want this or not? If technology becomes our next nature, and I think it does, and it's not going away, we might want it, but the technology is not going away, then we need the smartest and the brightest to design this in the best possible way. Thank you very much.